cortar para a palestra do Philip Stennis. Ele vai falar sobre web workers e um monte de coisa que é super legal, que eu, inclusive, já passei muito tempo estudando, mais ou menos sobre paralelismo e concorrência no JavaScript, que antigamente não era muito possível, né? que você só tem uma thread e tal, mas aí os web workers eles vão meio que consertar a parada. né? Vamos ver? Então, bem-vindo ao palco, Philip Stennis! Sing with me, sing for the ear, sing for the laughter, sing for the tear. Sing with me, search for today, maybe tomorrow, then I wanna take you away. Thank you. That was uh, possibly the best intro I had to a talk. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Philip Stanis, and I'm here to talk about how to think things off the main thread by using web workers and a library called WorkerDOM. A few things about myself. Uh, I'm a developer advocate at Google. My background is in front-end development, and I'm currently involved with the AMP project. If you uh, listen to uh, one of the previous talks, uh, there was a lot about what the AMP project is. This, pro uh, this talk will not actually be about AMP. Uh, this talk will be uh, about something that we built in response to something we needed for AMP. So I will, get, and I will talk more about that in a bit. I am also very passionate about open source software and UX and user interaction. So this is the reason why I got into front end in the first place. This is also my first time at uh, Brazil.js and also my first time in Brazil. And uh, I have to say I am enjoying it quite a lot. Thank you. And without further ado, uh, the first thing I would like to talk about is something that I, I think many of you are already familiar with, uh, which is called the event loop. Now, the event loop is just a fancy name for how JavaScript is executed. And the, uh, this is important because it becomes a little complicated uh, when we have things that are asynchronous. For synchronous things, uh, we are just execute, uh, JavaScript engines will just execute met, uh, methods one by one. And this is very straightforward. When one thing finishes, the next synchronous thing starts. However, it becomes more complicated when we have asynchronous calls. One of them is fetch. If you call fetch, uh, it will do something immediately. It will immediately make an HTTP call to the server, but then when the call, uh, when the server actually returns some information, there will be an asynchronous event that will be added to the event loop. And then the event loop will wait to finish all the synchronous things, and then it will run this uh, event that happened as a result of something you've done before. Another example is set timeout, where you just add something to the event loop uh, a, a certain number of milliseconds after you call it. Another example is just user interaction. If a user clicks on something and you're listening on quick events, then what will happen is this quick event will be queued on the event loop, again, waiting for the perfect moment for things to happen. Now, this is important because the whole event loop is running on a single thread. And this means that everything that you run is all on the same thread, even the async things. It will just wait for the synchronous things to be complete for them to get queued on this one thread. To make things worse, this is, the ex this is exactly the same thread that's used for the UI. This means that if you're running synchronous things on this thread, the UI is blocked. So if the user is interacting with your website, then they can't do anything because something is already running on that thread. And up until recently, this has been the only way to run things. You would just have to use this one thread that you're given. Luckily, things have changed. So now we have something called web workers. And I'd just like to have a quick show of hands. How many of you have heard about web workers at all in the past? There's quite a lot of hands. I'm happy to see that. But here's my second question. How many of you have used web workers in production on a website? I'm seeing maybe 10 hands. And I have a theory on what this is. But first, I would like to give a quick definition on what web workers actually are. 
According to MDN, web workers are simple means for web content to run scripts in background threads. And this is quite straightforward. We had one thread up until recently. We now have a way to run things on another thread. This is similar to how some other languages like Java just let you create a thread and run something on it. And then there are uh, ways to synchronize this with your main thread. And when it comes to code, it's trivially simple to create a web worker. You use the worker constructor and you give it the script. And then this script will run inside the web worker on a separate thread. And this is completely separate. You cannot share any variables or anything. The only way to communicate with it is to use uh, messages, post message and on message. And that's the only interaction you have with this new thread that you've created. Going back to our previous uh, analogy with the event loop, what I was really talking about was one event loop. But I was, I was talking about the one that's on the main thread. But when we create web workers, we are creating additional event loops on other threads. These event loops have nothing, in, uh, nothing shared with the main thread. They're just running independently. They may have their own synchronous calls. They may have their own asynchronous calls that are added the same way they're added to, main, to the main thread. They're just completely separate entities. And the only communication you, they have with the main thread is post message. Now, they have a variety of APIs available. In fact, most of JavaScript APIs are available on a web worker. But there is one exception, one really, really important exception. You can't access the DOM from the web worker because the DOM lives on the UI thread because the DOM is the UI. This really limits what you can do inside the web worker because you can't do anything with the DOM. And I believe for most websites, the DOM is really what you want to interact with. There are some exceptions where a lot of processing can be done on a web worker, but in most cases, most of the things you would do happen with the DOM. And this is where the problem comes. There are very few things you can do in a, wor in a web worker because you can't access the DOM. And now the problem becomes, how do I figure out what are the things I can put on a web worker? You need to redesign your whole system and just know what you can offload to the web worker in order for this to make sense. Otherwise, this just becomes a useful feature that nobody uses. Because unless your system is revol revolves around knowing what things can be on a worker and what things can be on the main thread, you will have a lot of trouble changing it so that you utilize web workers efficiently. Now, I would like to make a short digression and actually talk about the M project and why this was important to us and why we even investigate into all this. The M project is a web component framework. Uh, we built these components that allow people to make websites easily, in many cases without having to touch JavaScript at all. For example, we have the carousel component, which, just, which is just implemented in a way which we believe is efficient. So someone would just include the JavaScript file for this carousel and use some HTML markup, and this would all figure itself out. And every component we built, we built with the idea of solving these three problems. First is slow loading. It's very easy to have a very large JavaScript file that's render blocking on a website. And this will make websites load slowly because the whole file needs to download and then nothing will be rendered because it's render blocking and so on. So all of our components are asynchronous and are not render blocking. Then again, we have unresponsive pages. If something is running on the main thread and it's computationally intensive, then the main thread is blocked. And the UI is blocked as well and the user, for example, can't scroll can't select text. Um, if they try to type, there will be lag, and nobody likes that. Finally, the last one is probably the worst. If you have some image or an ad or something that doesn't have a known height, it might change its height when it loads. And when this happens, it will push everything uh, a little bit under. And this, is, uh, this will cause a real layout of the page, which can be really slow if the page is large, but also it's a horrible user experience. I, I believe in Everyone here has experienced this, and it's not nice when you click the thing that just moved a few centimeters down. So all of our components uh, are built with this in mind and trying to avoid these situations. And this came with a big caveat that you can't really use our components with arbitrary JavaScript. The reason is if we allow j arbitrary JavaScript, then users can interact with our components using JavaScript in a way which we did not intend and they can just break one of these principles easily. 
the whole idea revolves around only using the components from the AMP project that are tested with each other and that are <laughs> built with keeping these principles in mind. So what we were looking for here is a way to sandbox arbitrary JavaScript so that we can know what are the DOM mutations that are happening from, a, from some JavaScript that the user built and that we can know that these mutations would not affect the page in one of these bad ways, like slowing it down, uh, blocking the main thread, or just making a bad UX, or interacting with one of the components in a way which we didn't anticipate. We also want to make sure that the JavaScript run by the user doesn't block the main thread. We can't enforce efficient JavaScript. In fact, this is really hard. it's really hard to know what's efficient JavaScript and what isn't. So we want to make sure this JavaScript runs off the main thread. Now, as you probably guessed from the title of this talk and what I talked about, we believe web workers are a good way. So our goal can be summarized in one sentence. We want to give users DOM access inside the web worker. And what we came up with is a JavaScript library called Worker DOM. And what Worker DOM is, is perhaps easiest to, to explain by saying it's a remote control for the DOM. What Worker DOM does is re-implements the DOM where each call uh, to the DOM, each mutation, is actually an RPC, a post message sent to the main thread where the main thread would actually modify the DOM. So Worker DOM gives you a DOM implementation available inside the web worker that talks to the real DOM. But what's really happening behind the scenes is just a bunch of post messages going back and forth between the main thread and the web worker. So once again, it's a DOM implementation that encapsulates DOM mutations and sends them to the main thread. If we have some trivial code like this that creates a paragraph, sets some text to it, and then appends this paragraph to the body, if you just run this in, uh, in any web page, this will work. And what you expect will happen, you will get a new paragraph. But if you run this in a web worker and you use worker DOM, then worker DOM re-implements these calls. It re-implements document.create element. It re-implements element.append child. And what will happen behind the scenes is something like this. It will call post message, encapsulate all the changes you wanted to make to the DOM, and send them to the main thread. And then the main thread would receive this message, and based on it, it will recreate the DOM calls needed to apply the same mutation. Again, working as sort of a remote control. Now, you might be thinking this is not very efficient, and you're right. And good news is the previous slide was not really correct. It was a really big oversimplification. What Worker DOM actually does is keep a copy of the DOM inside of itself, like a shadow that acts the same way as the real DOM, and all the calls made are made to this copy of the DOM that's simulating it. Then it figures out the differences between the copy and the real thing, and it only sends these differences, and it also has a way of encoding them in a very efficient way. So for example, if you add an element and then immediately remove it, then you don't really need to send anything because no effective changes happen to the DOM. There's no, need, there's no reason to send append element and then remove element right after it. And uh, things like that mean that the main thread would only get the minimum number of operations, ideally, to achieve what you described in your code, which again makes it more efficient than um, just sending all of these calls directly. Uh, there's a lot of technical details here, so if you're interested, uh, you can read in our GitHub repo about more of how this diff me mechanism works and how the encoding works. And uh, I will also have this link later in the slide deck. But for now, um, the important thing to know is that worker DOM figures out what's the most efficient uh, set of calls needed on the main thread for the same changes to happen. And here's another example. Uh, I know this is uh, not very good code, so uh, it's not a good idea at a JavaScript conference to present bad JavaScript, um, but I'm going to go with it. Uh, what I have here is an input element and I have an output element. The input is just a text input and the output is a div. And every time a key is pressed, I make sure that the output contains the same thing as the value of the input. 
Uh, but I also want to highlight every instance when there are two square brackets right next to each other. And I do this by calling replace and replacing, uh, replacing it in the inner HTML uh, with uh, the same thing but wrapped inside a mark. Uh, and by default, mark will highlight it yellow. So that's a nifty thing. This code works. If you just try it in any web page, again, this is valid JavaScript code. Nothing unusual about it. But what I really want to do is run it in a web worker now. So the first thing to do would be to import the worker DOM library. There are many ways to do this. Depends on your setup. Either you can bundle it, you can use a module. So I won't really get into it. But let's assume at this point that you've imported the worker DOM library. Then you define the element that you're going to upgrade. The upgraded element is an element that's currently managed by a web worker. So here, this div is going to be upgraded. And I use the source attribute to specify, um, to specify which script is going to be the owner of this div after it's upgraded. And highlight.js is just the one from the previous slide. So I'm upgrading this uh, div with the script from the previous slide. And the way I'm doing that is by making a call to main thread.upgrade element. This is the call provided by worker DOM. And it only requires two arguments. One is the element that you would like to upgrade. And the second is the source script of worker DOM. Because remember, if you're creating a web worker, you, you're, the constructor requires you to have a JavaScript file. Uh, this is not really important for this talk. So you can check in the documentation how this works and what other arguments you can provide and what other ways there are of doing this. But the thing that you need to know is that you just need to call upgrade element, and this will create a web worker for you and make sure that this web worker has worker DOM, meaning it has the DOM API inside of it. Once we've done so, you will get exactly the result you expect. As I type into this text box, uh, any consecutive uh, two square brackets that are next to each other are going to be highlighted yellow. And again, this is. Even though I'm, I'm changing inner HTML, what's actually happening is that worker DOM is figuring out what are the nodes that need to be appended or removed to achieve this effect. So what's happening on the main thread is not modifying inner HTML. It's a series of uh, node, modifi node modifications in the DOM based on what worker DOM believes to be most efficient. So I went through a lot explaining how this works. But the most important question is always, why would you do this? And um, I think the most important thing would be separation of concerns. You want to, you would probably want, like in most software products, you would want to separate your business logic from what's used to paint the UI, for example. And this has been notoriously difficult with JavaScript, usually, because there's only one thread, and this thread owns the UI and all the business logic. And this gives you a way to ensure the main thread is only used for UI. If you use worker DOM, then worker DOM will only call DOM calls, and in fact, only the necessary DOM calls on the main thread. And everything else, all your other logic, can live in a web worker. Speaking of which, another reason is just the sheer simplicity of it. You could design your website and design, a, design your system around the idea that you offload the work that can be offloaded into a web worker, and you keep the DOM work inside the main thread. In fact, this is still probably a better idea if you can do it this way, because then you, this does introduce some latency. So if you design your system efficiently so that you can make use of web workers in a way which, is, which works for your use case and in a way which is also efficient, that's the best idea. But with this, you don't really need to think about it. If you just run everything in a web worker and let worker DOM figure out what needs to be on the main thread, this should be a really large time saver. But the most important thing, in my opinion, here uh, is the fact that you now no longer need to trust third-party scripts if you want to run them. At least in theory, this allows you to isolate any script and run it in a web worker and you also control which are the mutations that are going to be applied in the main thread. For example, you could tell worker DOM not to allow any images to be added by the script. This means that you can run it in a web worker, and wor the script would still be using the DOM as normal. But what will actually happen is that uh, 
uh, when the mutation has arrived on the main thread, worker don can block it. Or you can block different APIs that the script has access to inside the web worker itself. So you can limit the scope of what a uh, script that you're including can do. Of course, ideally, you will trust all your dependencies and you will live in a beautiful world where there are no malicious intents. But this gives you another option. This gives you the option to isolate things, which I believe is very important, especially as web applications get more and more complex with more and more dependencies that you may have no uh, large control over. Finally, uh, to go back to AMP, the way we use this is we created a web component called AMP script. And the AMP script component is quite similar to what we've seen on the previous slides. We have a script element, and we set the type to be text plain. The reason we do this is to make sure the browser doesn't execute the script. We just want to keep the script embedded in the file. Because hopefully it will not be a large script. Then uh, we reference the script by ID in our AMP script element, and inside of the AMP script element, we have the initial DOM. So initially, there is only this one button that's visible to the worker DOM. And when this button is clicked, we modify the inner HTML. Uh, now, the thing to know here is that when, I, uh, when we're modifying the body, this is not the body of the document. Worker DOM can only uh, will see the body as the inside of the element that was upgraded. So from the, point of, uh, from the point of this script, when it changes the body, it's actually changing the inside of the AMP script object. Finally, I would like to share some really interesting implementation details. And I find them interesting uh, largely because um, this, has been an interesting en uh, this has been an interesting engineering project. We had to implement most of the DOM, again, to uh, just make sure that it's fully DOM compatible. And we ran into a few situations where this was not as easy as we expected. First of all, a good, the good thing is, uh, assuming we have, we, assuming we make it fully compatible with the DOM, which it currently isn't, but most of the, the most used DOM calls are implemented. Uh, assuming something is fully compatible with the DOM, you can easily use frameworks with it, or any JavaScript library. For example, if you use React or Vue or Angular or even jQuery, all of these libraries will just use DOM under the hood. And because we're providing the DOM APIs, they, if they are running inside the worker, they will not even know they are in a worker. They will just be calling the same calls, and worker DOM will be doing everything in the background. This means that you can execute React uh, in a web worker, and you can just use it as is. There are no modifications needed to the React framework to make this happen. Like I said, document.body in the worker is actually the upgraded element. So the script that you're running in the worker cannot modify anything outside of this element. It would not be able to mutate the rest of your page. Of course, you can just upgrade the body itself if you want, then the body will map to the real body of the, of the document and everything is the same. But again, this is all about letting you control what the script can do and letting you limit the script from interacting with parts of the page that it's not supposed to interact with. Inner HTML was really interesting. We needed a way to parse this HTML, and web workers do not allow, do not have any native HTML parsing capabilities. So to implement changing inner HTML, we had to use an HTML parser inside a web worker. This is not, um, this is not a very efficient way of doing it, but this was the only way to ensure that we know what and changing in our HTML will actually do. Because behind the scenes, we need to know what does this translate to? What are the text nodes and elements that this is gonna add or remove? So that's why we have our own HTML parser inside Worker DOM. And what this means is that there might be some inconsistencies between how this works with the real DOM. Of course, if you ever, if you use this and you encounter any, please file a bug. We did test this thoroughly, and there shouldn't be any discrepancies, but because we re-implemented this with our own HTML parser, uh, you never know what might still be out there. Query selector was a similar situation. We needed to implement our own selector parser, and we did so. So this, for example, if it starts 
th even from simple things like starting with a hashtag and then mapping to get element by ID and similar things like that uh, are re-implemented, meaning that there might be, it might be rough around the edges and there are some limitations on what query selector can do. But again, an interesting situation where we needed to re-implement the DOM call. Get pounding client rect is an especially interesting uh, one. Get bounding client rect would return the bounding area of a given HTML element. Now, we can't do that inside the web worker. We need to know the layout of the whole page and calculate it in order to accurately know what the bounding rect of a single element is. So there is no way to implement this. Unlike inner HTML and query selector, where we found a way to implement it in a way that's similar to the DOM, there is no way to implement get bounding client rect. Instead, what we did was, when this call is made, we send a post message immediately to the main thread. The main thread, in the main thread we make this call, get the result, put it back in a post message and send it to the web worker. Unfortunately, this means we turn this synchronous call into an asynchronous call. So we instead provided get bounding client rect async, which returns a promise. The value is, will be exactly the same because it does run on the main thread. But this means that any code that uses this would have to call await get bounding client rect async instead of calling get bounding client rect directly. And this is so far the only uh, API call that's implemented this way. But we might come across other methods that similarly can't be implemented in a satisfactory way. We originally considered doing things, uh, doing this for query selector as well, for example. Um, but this would, again, make things a lot more complicated because you would turn a synchronous call into an asynchronous one. So this, we decided the better compromise is to create our own selector parser. And once again, we just tried to implement everything the way existing libraries and frameworks would expect the DOM to behave. So these are some of the caveats that we came across. Um, this is a very early stage project, I have to say. So if you do decide to use it, please let us know, give us your feedback, and uh, ask any questions and report bugs if you come across any. Um, we are aware that it's a big risk to just move everything to a web worker, but we do hope that over time this will become a stable library and possibly a pattern that many websites could start relying on. And that's all I have. Um, if you have any questions, uh, I'll be around today and tomorrow. You can also reach out to me on Twitter, and uh, this is the GitHub repo of our project. Thank you again. Thank you, Philip. Great talk. <laughs>